We want to pray for for both this series and also the one starting next door on Esther. So uh, we, we're looking forward to how the Lord may use these, both of these series in different ways uh, with our church. And uh, it's always nice if you, if you go to one, you can listen to the other one during the week if you, if you want to or something like that. So it's a nice to have that option there as well. Um, we are going to pray and then we're going to be jumping into a, a, a series on uh, progressive covenantalism. Don't let the name scare you. Uh, it, th this is a really important and good series about how we are to put our whole Bible together. Uh, how we're supposed to read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation as a single unified story, ultimately pointing to Jesus. And so uh, I'll pray for us, and then we'll look at a couple of texts, and then we'll try to just give a sense of where we're going, because there's just yeah. so much going on here. So let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, thank you for a chance to uh, look at your word and to study it, uh, not just one particular passage in context, but to see how uh, all of your scripture from a bird's eye view uh, holds together from beginning to end as you seek to uh, bring your kingdom into this world through covenants that you've established uh, throughout redemptive history. And uh, God, I pray that you would help us to see how uh, the Old Testament is so relevant and so inspired and so inerrant and so important to the Christian life today and how it sheds light on the work of Christ and what is happening in the new covenant era that we're living in as we await the consummation and the final day when uh, there is final judgment and then there's a new heavens and a new earth and there's also the lake of fire. And so God, as we anticipate what is to come, help us to see uh, the end from the beginning, help us to see how it all begins to hold together. Uh, I don't think anyone has figured out every single detail of this perfectly, but we can certainly uh, work through this and, and get a better understanding than we had before. And I pray that uh, this series, we would uh, leave with a, with a clearer, better understanding of how your whole uh, scripture holds together and is unified in Christ than we did even when we started. And uh, to that end, Lord, I pray you would be glorified and honored. I also pray for the Esther class right next door that you'd be with, I think today, Jerry and Scott and Papa and others as they'll teach in the coming weeks that you would use Esther in a great way to show your providence and your goodness and your power to save your people and uh, how sovereign you are and how good you are, um, even when people uh, don't uh, see you as clearly. And so I pray that you'd work through that series in a great way. And, uh, and use that as well for the good of our church. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, open your Bibles uh, to Luke chapter 24. Uh, so hold your place there and also John chapter 5. We want to just open with a few texts um, to kind of set the stage for, uh, for what we're going to be doing here. Uh, Luke chapter 24, we're going to look at two sections, uh, verses 25 through uh, 27, and then verses 44 through 49, and I believe in John uh, 5, 32 through 30, yeah, 39 to a few, few, oh, a few more okay, verses, right. 38, 39, right okay. in there. All right, so Luke chapter 24, let's look at, um, let's look at verse... Uh, let's start in verse 24. We're picking up on a conversation. These folks are uh, relating the, the folks on Emmaus what, what happened. And um, they say, Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it, um, just as the women had said. Uh, they're talking to Jesus, um, and they don't know it's him. Uh, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And then fast forward to verse 44. Uh, Jesus, talking to his disciples later, uh, says this. He said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written, that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. And I'm just going to stop there and make one comment and then turn it over to Mark to read. Uh, it's interesting what Jesus is saying here is when you read the Old Testament, now that Jesus has come and done all that he's done, you should be able to see, we should be able to see that the Old Testament was saying that the Messiah had to suffer and rise three days later and that we should go out into all the world and preach the gospel, calling people to repentance uh, and proclaiming 
uh, forgiveness of sins in his name. Okay, so we go to the Old Testament, and it should lead us to exactly what Jesus is saying here. Um, now that he said it, now that he's explained it, now that we have the Spirit, we should be able to reach that conclusion from the Old Testament. Yes, which is, uh, it's, it's pro- perhaps shocking to some people now th- when you read mm-hmm. that, but back at the time he said it, it would have been utterly yes. astonishing that he says that about the Old Testament. And a similar passage is if you flip to the right to John chapter 5, and Jesus is talking to the Pharisees and uh, some of the Jewish leaders. And uh, th- this text to me is very similar to Luke 24. I love this passage as well. Uh, look with me here and uh, look at John 5:39. So Jesus is saying to the religious leaders, you search, John 5, 39, you search the scriptures. So just pause there. What, what testament does that have to be? That's got to be old. The New Testament has not yet been written. So Jesus is referring to all of the Old Testament scriptures. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they, the Old Testament, that bear witness about me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. And then if you look at verse 45, he says, Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, on whom you have set your hope. For if you believed Moses, you would, uh, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? So Jesus does not detach himself from the Old Testament. He sees himself as the fulfillment of the Old Testament. Jesus actually says, if you're reading the Old Testament rightly, who are you going to see? You're going to see that it's all ultimately pointing to him, to his work, to what he's come to do. And he says, there's a way to search the Old Testament and miss Jesus, in which case we're actually missing eternal life. So to have eternal life is to find Jesus in the text and to love him, trust him, adore him, uh, live for him. And we can do that through the Old Testament and the New Testament. So Jesus is holding the whole of the canon together as as one uh, cohesive story pointing to himself. And that's critical for understanding where we're going uh, in this series. And in the Luke 24 passage, did did you notice Jesus splits the Old Testament into three parts? He says the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. And some of you know this already, but the Hebrew Old Testament, what they called the Hebrew Bible, was made up of three parts, and they called it the Tanakh. I'm going to give you some fancy words. Some of you know these words, okay? The T-N-K, the Tanakh. The T stands for Torah. That's easy, right? That's the books of Moses, the first five books of the Bible. Then the next one, T-N-N, is Nevi'im, which stands for the the prophets. And then the last one uh, is the K, uh, the Ketuvim. That's referring to the writings, starting with the book of Psalms. So for the Jewish people at the time, their Bible... Uh, this, this always kind of, you think about this, their, their Old Testament was the exact same books you have in your Bible right now, as long as you don't have a Catholic Bible with Apocrypha, because they, they did not have the Apocrypha in the Hebrew Bible. If you have the, what we have as our Bibles right now, it, your Old Testament is the same exact one that Jesus had as his Hebrew Bible. The only difference is the order of the books was in a different order. So they had the Torah, the, the Nevi'im, the Ketuvim. And what Jesus says is he, he splits the Bible into the exact same three parts the Hebrew people did. And he says, the, 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 the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms are about me. So he says, the entire Hebrew canon is God's word. It's scripture, and it's all ultimately anticipating me. That's breathtaking. And again, this is not the point of our series, but Jesus does not include the apocryphal or extra books. He doesn't include the Maccabees and that and those kinds of things. So he's talking about the Bible that we have, our Old Testament, and he clearly sees it as pointing to himself. Yeah, and I mean, that, that gets to what we want to do with this is what you said so many times is how do we piece the Bible together? Um, and when we go to the Old Testament along with the New, if we're not seeing Jesus as we put the parts together, we're not putting it together rightly. Um, he really is at the center of it all. His, his, who he is as the eternal son of God, as the Messiah, his saving work, and, and all of that, it's meant like God intends us, if we're going to read his word rightly, to see in the Old Testament that it's pointing to Jesus and what he does. And so, if, like you said, if we don't get to that, then we have misread the Bible. But again, if, if that's the case, how did we do that? Like we can say yep. in principle, yeah, we're, it's supposed to point to Jesus, but what does that actually look like? You know, can we just make the Old Testament say whatever we want it to say in order to get it to Jesus? Or is there something in the text itself that leads us to Jesus? And we're going to argue we don't have as much creative freedom because we're, we're want to be bound to the text. And so what, what one of the big things we want to do with, with this study is how does the text itself, we want to answer the question, how does the text itself show us how it points to Jesus. And it does. Thankfully, it does. It gives us so much. As we go through this, you're going to see this more and more. And it, this kind of study, I remember 
um, one of my seminary classes was on the work of Christ. Um, but one of the, the kind of the foundations for that was the story of the Bible. How do you fit it together? It was one of the most helpful things mm-hmm. in the world for me because I knew a lot of Bible facts. I mean, I'm, I'm at seminary, I'm getting a good education, but something about that class really pieced things together for me. And it was like, man, that, like it makes sense in a way it had never made sense before. Um, and so a study like this has the potential of really unlocking the fullness of the Bible to us because we see what's going on from beginning to end, how you make sense of it as you read it and what it's all about. So like this stuff, it gets me really excited because this more than any subject, even systematic theology that I love so much, this kind of whole Bible piecing together unified story, it opened scripture to me like nothing else Mm -hmm. did. No, that's the same for me. So just, we'll start with our, uh, some of our resources. And uh, there, there's different uh, books that have been written. Uh, so the, the, there's kind of like, think of these as three levels of books. You can see by their sizes that they're very different in terms of their, their depth. But you've got, uh, this, this book right here is called Kingdom Through Covenant, written by two great scholars, Stephen Wellam and Peter Gentry, uh, who were both at the time at Southern Seminary. Then uh, Stephen Wellam wrote a shorter version, which we're kind of loosely basing this series on, called uh, Christ from Beginning to End, how the full story of Scripture reveals the full glory of Christ. And then there's a really, this is doesn't that make you feel a little bit better right there? This one right here is by Tom Schreiner, who's also at Southern, and he wrote a book called Covenant and God's Purpose for the World. This is a great, really, uh, uh, a very simple, but not, not watered down, really, a very simple, but very good approach to how you understand uh, the Bible as covenant. So if you think of these, these books are all saying very similar things that we're going to be saying here, but just at different levels of depth. And th- these are books that we're using to sort of uh, base this series on. And um, a question you might be asking is, you know, why should I care about this series? Well, we've already mentioned seeing how the whole Bible fits together is a big part of this. So here's, here's just four things. You could list a lot more than four, just a couple opening things to mention here. Uh, so why should I be interested in this series? Number one, like we've been saying, to better see how the whole Bible tells one unified story. We could go on a big rant here, and I, believe me, I am tempted to. Um, when, when well-known pastors, not far from us, say things like we should unhitch ourselves from the Old Testament, and they've said even worse things more recently. But if, if they were to say, we're, we're going to unhitch the Bible from the Old Testament, we don't really need the Old Testament to live the Christian life. It's not really our covenant. We should kind of just jettison the Old Testament from our Bible and just read the New Testament. That's basically what the pastor said to his 38,000 um, attendees. And, and I just want to say, first of all, that's a horrible mistake. Uh, you're, you're basically saying we could just throw out 75% of our Bible because if you haven't been looking recently, uh, in my plain, plain text English Bible, the first 802 pages is the Old Testament. So we're talking 75% of our Bible is the Old Testament. So we, we don't want to denigrate the Old Testament. We don't want to make fun of the Old Testament. We don't want to minimize the Old Testament. We want to maximize the Old Testament. It is God's inspired and errant word. It is relevant in how we understand the gospel. It is relevant for how we live our Christian lives. Yes, we're in a different era of redemptive history than Israel was in in the Old Covenant, but it doesn't mean that this is not still God's relevant and inspired word. Uh, At 1 Corinthians 10, Paul says, speaking of the exile, no, 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 the uh, Exodus generation who died in the wilderness, right, most of them, you know what Paul says? He says, the things that happened to them took place as, literally the Greek word is types, Mm -hmm. we're going to talk about typology, they took place as types or examples for us to learn from today in the New Covenant era. So Paul doesn't unhitch anything from the Old Testament. He says we need to be learning the the lessons that we learn from, say, the Exodus generation. That Paul applies the Exodus generation to the Corinthians in the New Covenant era and has no problem whatsoever drawing moral application, Christocentric application from from those kinds of texts. Uh, Greg, thoughts on 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 that idea? Um, I, I wholeheartedly agree. Like the from beginning to end, the Bible is one story, and as Christians, the Old Testament is our story too. That's not just the story of the Jews. That's your story, and it's my story because through faith in Jesus, you know this, um, we, you know, we become heirs of all of God's promises, like you know, children of Abraham. And if you're children of Abraham, you're children of God. And if you're children of God, then you know, you're part of what God's been doing to create and save uh, a people for his name. Um, and so the Old Testament matters just as much for all of us as the New Testament does. I mean, and, you know, it's, it's the very foundation and the basis from which we get the gospel, which we know about Jesus, and we're about to get into to, to Jesus. But, like, you can't make sense of the New Testament, the categories mm-hmm. and sacrifice and temple and all that. You can't make sense of that without the Old Testament. 
And so the moment you, un, you, you unhitch from that, you are severing yourself from the very thing that gives you what you need to understand Jesus and, and what God's doing in the world. Yeah, and I, I know I've said this years in the past, but it, people sometimes ask the question, and I think it's a legitimate question to ask, as long as we do it with the right attitude of humility, not with arrogance, but there's a question, why didn't Jesus come sooner? Well, why, why, wasn't, why didn't Eve literally give birth to the Messiah? Why wasn't there a virgin birth with Eve, and Jesus is born on Genesis chapter 4, and then Jesus dies on the cross in Genesis 5, and you know, why wait for 4,000 years for, for the Messiah to come? And I, I don't act like I can read God's mind, but God does give us some very big clues and indicators, and, and some of those are what you're hinting at right now, which is if, you were to, if Jesus were to show up in Genesis 4, and the announcement was made, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, would that have any meaning at all at that moment in history? I don't think so. If someone said, the great high priest has come, the Mel Melchizedek high priest has, has arrived, you're like, who's Melchizedek, and what's a high priest? Don't know. The son of David, you know, son of David, have mercy on me. The blind men will cry in next week's sermon text. The son of David, have mercy on me. Who's David and why should I care about his son, right? The opening verse of the New Testament. This is the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Who's David? Who's Abraham? Why, was there a promise made to these men? What is that promise? Why does it matter to me? Uh, so you, you start piecing it together. The Bible ends with a new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. What's Jerusalem? Who cares about Jerusalem? The Old Testament tells you why Jerusalem matters, why Israel matters in the plan of God, and why God is ultimately going to bring a new Jerusalem. So th to have the categories of atonement, propitiation, high priest, lamb of God, all these things are, are, are fleshed out in the Old Covenant era, and they find their telos, right? Their end point, their mm -hmm. goal in Jesus when, when, he, when he arrives on the scene. And then fleshing this out, number three on the screen, to understand how to interpret much Old Testament prophecy about the future of Israel. Um, obviously, what, yesterday, there was a, a war starting in, in Israel right now, which looks like a horrific thing from the little that I've gotten to study. But even, even questions will come up, how are we supposed to understand those kinds of events mm -hmm. in light of biblical prophecy? Does the Bible speak to what's happening right now, or does it not? Does it speak directly or indirectly, and how are we supposed to understand those things? Are there major differences of opinion amongst Christians today in how we read those kinds of stories? Yes. So, so that, that'll be part of what we talk about. And let me just add to this. Do you know how much of the Old Testament is predictive prophecy about the future of Israel and what God's people's future is like? It's a lot, right? There's a lot of Isaiah, Ezekiel, even Jeremiah. And then how are we supposed to read those now that the time of fulfillment has come with Messiah Jesus? How are we supposed to see those fulfilled? And how do the New Testament authors see those fulfilled? And just another just really practical thing would be the covenant signs in the New Covenant. Do we baptize unbelieving infant children? Do we believe in infant baptism? Well, of course we don't as a, as a Baptist church, but why not? And does this have anything to do with how we put our Bible together? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely it, it does. So any last thoughts on that, Greg? Uh, no, just, just good points. Okay, good so points. we'll move into hermeneutical methods. And Greg, can you start us off here? Um, you mentioned uh, you've got different ways of looking. What is, first of all, what is hermeneutics? That sounds like, I heard someone say one time, Herman who? Who is this guy? Herman? Uh, so <laughs> hermeneutics, what, what are we talking about here? It was Todd Friel was making I, a joke. I saw a meme <clears throat> with that with a certain prosperity preacher that I won't mention. Um, <laughs> like Herman, I never heard of him. Um, all right, so uh, the importance of hermeneutics, uh, you got to understand what the word is. The word literally refers to the science of interpreting the Bible, like how you interpret the Bible. That's Hermeneutics. It, it's rooted in um, the old, uh, you know, the name Hermes, the Greek god who was the messenger mm -hmm. uh, for the gods. And so it's, it's rooted in, in that name and what that name means. But it's simply how you interpret your Bible, uh, layman's terms. Um, and it doesn't need to be more complicated than that. I mean, really. Um, it's one of those things. We, we do a lot of these things instinctively every time we open up our Bibles, um, and we don't always realize that we're engaging in this discipline that academics and professors and all that, they're, you know, they, they might be doing it at a more technical level at times, but essentially it's the same thing. Same thing like, you know, we say the Bible says... That's a systematic theology statement because we're assuming the whole Bible is speaking the same message about this one thing. That's systematic theology is what the whole Bible says about something. Um, so hermeneutics is just how you interpret the Bible. Um, and there are, there are some methods in this. Some of this you might be familiar with. Some of this you might not. Um, again, I think some of this is going to be instinctive. Mm -hmm. um, instinctive to you um, just because you've taken English classes before, you understand how language works, how you're supposed to read. Um, but let's just look at a few words here. Um, first, we've got, I'm making sure, I think I might have added one um, to the point you have up there. First, textual. What does the text actually say? 
What does it actually say? When you open to any part of the Bible, what is that text that you're reading, that passage, what is it saying? And you say, well, how do I know that? Well, that leads to another word, which is contextual. You know, you know what, what, what's going on around it. That's the context. What's surrounding the text that you're reading? Um, you know, what came right before? What comes after? That way you kind of get in the flow of a text. You know, you know, you don't get to decide. Like, you're figuring out what is going on, what it's actually saying. Um, you pay attention to literature. That's the one I, I didn't put up there. So the literary aspect of hermeneutics, is it poetry? Is, is it narrative? Is it like wisdom literature? Is it someone speaking? You know, all of that matters. Why? Because you're not going to read poetry the same way you read Paul's letters. Paul's, when Paul writes, he's writing straightforward. You can detect, you know, logic and reason. He's got a point here that he develops and it leads into this point. So there, there's building and all of that. When you read poetry, poetry is completely different than, than reading a letter where somebody's explaining things and communicating things. Poetry still has just as much meaning. You just don't approach it the same way. Um, so that's the literary aspect. You look at grammatically, I mean, we know this, verbs matter, nouns matter, how sentences uh, connect to one another, you know, is it an active verb, is it a passive verb, like, you know, we understand these things, and that's, again, we do that instinctively when we read the Bible, we pay attention, like, uh, was it Romans 5, 1, uh, therefore, having been justified by faith, or since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God, present tense matters in that case, not let us have, it's we have, if you're if you're in Christ, if you have faith in Jesus, right now you have peace with God. So we understand the importance of verb tenses. Again, we, we do this all the time. And then lastly, another just basic thing here is the historical aspect. You know, that's the culture of the time, you know, understanding nuances about language and, and stuff like that. And again, we know this at an instinctive level. We might not always put it in the terms we're using, but we all do this whenever we read a book. Like when you read a novel just for pleasure, you know, you're, you're, you understand this is a work of fiction. Um, and so you treat it as that. You don't treat a novel as you do the, you know, the newspaper or um, a biography. You read a biography, you're expecting to get real facts about a person, his, his or her life and, and stuff like that. So again, hermeneutics, it, it can be like one of those big theology words that, that oh, I don't know if I can handle that. No, you absolutely can because you use these tools. We do this all the time. Now, but there's some unique things about the Bible that, again, we're familiar with this. Maybe we haven't drawn as much attention to it. Um, some other words up here. Mark, do you have anything you want to say on that before we move on? Uh, yeah, well, yeah, I don't want to get sidetracked here, but just I'll, I'll put up on the screen what the same thing Greg just was mentioning. So you, you, we determine uh, each passage according to the intent of the author. So sometimes people will say, do you take the Bible literally? That's going to that's gonna be a big kind of word, right? So literally. And my answer is you, you can't necessarily say yes or no to that question because it depends on what you mean. The question is, I want to interpret the Bible based on the author's intention when they're writing. And that will be determined and shaped by the genre of what they're writing. Like you're saying, if, it's, if, if something is fiction, which the Bible's not going to have fiction in it, but if something's fiction, you know that going in, it's going to determine how you read it. Um, with, with the Bible, um, history is to be taken literally. So that's why when you read uh, the, the early chapters of Genesis, I take those literally because I think we're dealing with history here. But if you're dealing with uh, poetry, like in Song of Solomon, you're going to have very like figurative uh, language that's going to go on there. You're not going to take that literally because you're going to completely ruin the meaning of the poem or whatever it might be. Uh, with prophecy, um, similar kind of rules apply. Like an example would be um, Revelation, which we, we've spent some time in, in the summer a big debate with Revelation is, do we take Revelation primarily literally or not? And the question is, well, what kind of genre are we dealing with? I think it's apocalyptic prophecy. And so we would argue that there's heavy symbolism in these kinds of books and that they're not to be read just at face value. But that's going to be a debate amongst different Christians. So genre is very important in determining, determining what a passage is saying. Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. So um, again, you know, hopefully that, that's, that's easy to understand. Um, the next few points here, um, make sure my computer's working, um, might be a little less familiar. Um, again, I, th I think if you've read the Bible, if you've been in church, you, you have a, a sense of, of what we're talking about here. But there's a category of hermeneutics called redemptive historical. Um, and what that gets at is it, it, uh, 
it trusts that the Bible, like we said, is telling one unified story, and that is a story of God redeeming sinners, re, uh, a story of redemption where God you know, buys us back from and rescues us out of our slavery to sin and death and brings him back to, to himself. And so from the very beginning to the very end, the Bible is telling a unified story of redemption. And so that is coloring and it's shaping everything we read. You, like, for instance, you start in uh, Genesis 3, uh, 15, the, the first promise of a Savior after Adam and Eve had sinned, you know, God says to, to the serpent, you know, the seed of, of the woman, <clears throat> you know, you're gonna, I'm going to put enmity between, between you and her, and her seed is going to crush your head, and you're going to bruise his heel. That's a promise of someone coming and defeating the one who just you know, uh, led, led humanity astray, you know, which brought in all, all the problems that we see in the world today. But that promise of a coming Savior, of someone who's going to come and fix what just got messed up, that shapes and colors everything that comes after it. Whether or not it specifically references it, that's hanging over everything. Hanging over everything. And so you're, you, you learn from that that you're constantly asking, you know, if God said He's going to send this Savior... Who is he? When's he coming? What's he going to look like? How's he going to win that victory? And so everything from then on is leading in one way or another towards the coming of that Savior. And so we say redemptive historical, the redemption this Savior is going to bring, um, everything is, is leading towards that. It's leaning towards that, if you will. Um, and so that's why we say one aspect of hermeneutics is redemptive historical. How is this helping us understand how God is bringing salvation, accomplishing salvation, uh, and more like that? Thoughts? That's good. So let, let me mention here, and I've got a copy of the book, but I'll put it on the screen here also. So this book is a guy named Benjamin Merkel. He, he's from uh, Southeastern uh, Theological Seminary. He wrote this little book. Very, I found this to be extremely helpful on this issue. And uh, I'm going to put a chart on the screen here that uh, he puts in this book. And just take a second to, uh, I know the words are sideways, so uh, just look at it for, for a few seconds here. And what you'll see on the screen, and I'll try to write on it so you can see a little bit uh, better, uh, you kind of have a split down the center, and on this side of the split, you have all forms of dispensationalism or dispensational theology. We'll talk about what that means if you're not as familiar with that. And then on the other side of the screen, you have something called covenant theology, which is uh, going the other way. So um, essentially, uh, just to stand up here, uh, essentially you have three different versions of dispensational theology, and that is one way of putting your Bible together. Uh, it's, it's become much more popular in the last 200 years because it really was formed in the 1830s. Uh, John Nelson Darby and others, Plymouth Brethren, uh, put this together, and it's a very uh, specific system of how to put your Bible together and how the Old and New Testaments fit together, especially the issue of Israel and the church. And so that's one way of doing it. And I, I do think that it's, it's kind of changed over time. It's become less uh, intense and a little bit more uh, progressive is what they say, a little bit less intense. But... Um, so that, that is, a lot of us grew up with like left behind and those kinds of things. That's going to be dispensational theology. And then on the other side, you have what I grew up with, which is covenant theology, which is generally a very good thing. A number of our guys just took a class this summer uh, in covenant theology at Faith Presbyterian Church. And uh, this is going to be more Presbyterian in, in its way of looking at things. And there's different ways it can become more extreme with Christian reconstructionism. But uh, generally, covenant theology is more of the PCA perspective on how to put your Bible together. And we are arguing for Put it this way, James Hamilton, who's a great, a great guy on this stuff, he says, I'm convinced that the right answer, like the bullseye, is somewhere between dispensationalism and covenant theology. That the bullseye is somewhere in here somewhere. I think that's correct. And we're going to give you one perspective on that that I think is most persuasive, which is something called progressive covenantalism. And what this is about is basically one of the big ways to talk about this is, you see how it says uh, contin uh, discontinuity and continuity on the extreme ends of the screen. Here's the question that's being answered. How much dissimilarity or similarity is there between Old Testament Israel and the New Testament church? This is one of the big questions, right? God's people in the Old Covenant are called Israel. God's people in the New Covenant are called the church. And so how are we supposed to understand how these two groups interconnect or relate to each other? Dispensationalism is going to show, is going to, the further you get this way, the what? the sharper the distinction is between Israel and the church, the, the stronger and more intense the, the distinction is, and the more God has different plans for these two different groups that, are, that end up becoming quite different the further you go this way. As you can imagine, on the, again, I grew up in the PCA in a great church at Faith Presbyterian. Uh, in covenant theology, what you're going to hear is extreme similarity or extreme continuity between Israel and the church. 
So that you'll hear Puritan authors often call Israel the church in the Old Testament. And, and, and so it, they just act like they, they go together extraordinarily similar. And they're, they're, they kind of, Israel is the church in the Old Testament. The, the church is Israel in the New Testament. And there's just an extreme similarity between the two here. And we're going to argue for not, not, not identifying the two as identical to one another, but there being a close connection between Israel and the church through what Christ has done. So Greg, thoughts on this chart? Because I think this begins to get at some of what we're covering here. Um, yeah, I have a lot of <laughs> thoughts on this chart. Um, but I, I can't really add to what you said other maybe just to reaffirm it. Like, um, th this is what lies in the background. Like if, if you grew up uh, typical, you know, evangelical, you know, even independent fundamental church, um, I'm going to stand up. Please do, do that. Th this from like this side over is what you grew up with. And it, it wasn't really, um, Acknowledge it just is what the Bible taught. Like there, there, like there were other aberrant views, aberrant views, um, and stuff like that, that oh, other Christians somewhere believe. But this is the faithful interpretation of the Bible. It was the air you breathe. Um, it's, it's typically, at least in the churches I've seen it, people I've talked with, it's the only way you think about it. Um, anything else is not being as faithful to the Bible as it could be. And again, but, you know, not casting any, like if, you know, we want to be convinced of what the Bible says. We absolutely want to be convinced, um, you know, th that we're, we're going down the right road. And folks in these churches are very convinced of this. Um, but it's what lies in the background. There, there's assumptions about how the Bible fits together. There's assumptions about the nature of the church. Assumptions about the, you know, the gospel. Will the gospel succeed? Assumptions about how the future is going to play out uh, based on how, what's, where you fall on this spectrum. Okay, um, and as, as Mark said, um, we're going to be kind of somewhere in the middle between covenant and, uh, and dispensationalism, which recognizes there are some differences between the church and Israel. They're not exactly the same thing, okay, but we don't want to so separate them that we actually create two peoples of God. Um, because as we're going to show, we, we really don't believe Scripture teaches that. God's people are one. Are there distinctions? Yes. Um, but those distinctions are not so sharp that God has one plan for Israel and another for the church, okay? It's all part of the same one united plan um, that we're hopefully going to be able to show that progresses along the different covenants um, in Scripture. So is, is that giving some sense of what this is about? I, I know this can be a confusing topic. If this is new to you, it's really hard to sort of get your bearings on what, what is, what's going on here. But let me just, let me, I'm, we're going to keep standing up. This is great. So <laughs> I, I got one more, one more thing. I just to kind of give you, a, I'm trying to make this tangible to real life. Like what, how does this affect me on the ground level? Just, just to give one example. And, and uh, Nathan Long, you wrote a long paper about this, uh, this summer that uh, is all about uh, baptism. And so j just, just to give you an example of how this would work practically, like why does this matter? If you fall on the more PCA covenant theology side, then you would see extreme similarity between Old Testament Israel and the church, right? So get this. In the Old Covenant in Israel, if you have parents who hopefully are believers in the covenant community of Israel, if they have a child who is born, soon after that child's born, a week after the child's born, the covenant sign is given circumcision to that child, the male children. Even though that child is not yet a believer, the child is born into the covenant community. They're part of Israel, whether they believe in Jesus yet or not. Clearly, they don't believe when they're born. And so do you see, if you believe that Israel, that the church replaces Israel, in, 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 not replaces, is Israel in the sense of like the church is a continuation of Israel, do you see the implication? If you have believing parents who are part of a church, the covenant community, when they have a child who's born a week after, soon after birth, what do you do? You give the new covenant sign to your child, which would be baptism. So do you see, this really does matter in terms of how we live our Christian lives, because if you see extreme continuity between Israel and the church, you're going to be baptizing your babies when they're born. And if you see that there's actually some dissimilarity that the new covenant brings that actually changes things about the old covenant and fixes some problems with the old covenant, namely unregenerate members, it's one of the things the new covenant we would argue fixes about the new covenant, then you would not be giving the covenant sign to someone who does not profess faith in Christ. So it starts very much high in our minds and it takes some work to work through this issue, but it comes out having very practical ramifications, I mean, extremely practical ramifications on how we, how we uh, constitute ourselves as churches and, and how, we, uh, how we think about living uh, the Christian life. Yeah, so all that uh, in thinking of redemptive historical uh, aspect of hermeneutics, how does God's plan unfold? Um, and again, depending on where you are, you're going to see it unfolding in different ways. Now, the cool part is, 
there is a, a common agreement that Jesus is the Son of God, He is the Messiah, He is the Savior, um, and you have to have faith in Him. And so this is, and I, I want to I make sure we stress this enough, this is an in-house debate amongst Christians. Absolutely. This is not, if you disagree with me, you're unfaithful to Scripture, you don't love Jesus really, because if you really love Jesus, you'd see it just like I do. This is not that. Um, we, we quote people on both sides of this thing all the time in our yes, church. We quote we wonderful, like Sinclair Ferguson would be on Covenant Theology, R.C. Sproul, Covenant Theology, phenomenal Bible teachers. On this side, John MacArthur would be somewhere in this realm over here. But we love John MacArthur. We quote him a lot here at this church. So this is not one of those uh, absolute dividing lines in, in, the, yes. in the Christian church. But it, at the same time, it does affect um, how we think about the Bible, like what's in the background when we read. Um, something's got to be there. Um, and, you know, what we're trying to do is, is piece it together in the best way so that you have the best framework lingering in the background, shaping how you read, how you think. You know, when, when certain things are said, you're like, oh, I get it because of all of this stuff going on up here. Two other words, um, if you want to throw that back up, the, the four hermeneutics things here, um, typological and canonical. Uh, Mark, will you talk about typology briefly? Yeah, yeah. So uh, typology is a subject. I'll just tell you a quick story. I don't think I've told this story much because you said you hadn't heard it before about my Bible college experience. But Go for it. I, I was in Bible college, uh, and uh, I, 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 I'm sure I'd been taught typology some growing up, but I, I, it wasn't as clear in my mind. Like, what is this thing? And I would read, just be honest with you, I was struggling with doubts in my early college years about the truth of the Bible, uh, I, the new atheists were on the rise with Hitchens and Dawkins, and I was kind of bothered by them, and I didn't quite know how to answer all these things. And one of my big questions was, just being honest, my early years of college, was how the New Testament authors quote the Old Testament. Sometimes, the, the skept, I had this skeptical part of me in the back of my brain that would say horrible things into my ear, okay? And part of, part of, part of in the back of my brain, there was something telling me, you know, the way Matthew just quoted the book of Hosea, uh, doesn't seem like how Hosea meant that to be used in its original context. It sounds like Matthew, this is the, this is the I think this is satanic ultimately, but the fleshly part of my mind was saying, it seems like Matthew is manipulating a text out of its context originally and making it point to Jesus in some sort of artificial way. And this was deeply bothering me in my early Bible college years. I, I didn't know how to answer these questions. And I, was just, I, I didn't have an easy answer. I didn't know what to say. I was like, like for instance, the one I'm thinking of is Matthew 2, when Matthew says, of uh, Remember, Jesus goes to Egypt uh, during the, the Bethlehem uh, story, and he's in Egypt, and then God delivers him, and it says, out of Egypt I've called my son is the fulfillment of prophecy. That's from Hosea 11.1. 1. I, mean, I don't know Hosea, so let me go back and find Hosea 11.1. 1. I'll read it. And it, in context, it's referring to God delivering Israel from the Exodus. It's not a predictive prophecy in that sense. It's, it's describing the historical events of Israel coming out of Egypt, and God called Israel his son. He says, out of Egypt I've called my son. I'm thinking, is Matthew misusing the Old Testament. This is, this is like, I, I was horrified that the Bible might not be true. And that, that was the kind of stuff I was dealing with early college years. I, that was my great time of crisis of faith years, my early years of college. And I'm so grateful to be past those years in that sense. But uh, one of the things that just turned the lights on was a two-week course I took on the Gospel of Matthew. I still have the commentary. I was looking at, I had the commentary right next to me. It's on my desk right now at home. Uh, I got that commentary my, for my class. Uh, written by R.T. France, who's generally a very good Matthew scholar. And I'm reading his introduction. And I, you can see the highlights and the underlining to this day. Like it's about to bleeding through the other side of the page. I was underlining everything for these pages. He introduces the theme of typology. I'm like, what, what is that? What, what is he talking about? And he basically says this, listen, you've got to understand that Jesus doesn't just fulfill specific prophecies in the Old Testament. Like, the Messiah will come riding a donkey into Jerusalem, in Zechariah. That's just a specific prophecy of the Messiah. Okay, so there, there are some verses that are just, it's, it's just Jesus is the only answer to that question. He says, no, there are, there are other things that Jesus fulfills. And this is what he, this is what he says. Jesus doesn't just fulfill a, a half dozen specific prophecies. No, he fulfills trajectories that run through the Old Testament. The, these are themes, institutions, roles, um, th things that run through like, like uh, almost like rebar through concrete. They run through the Old Testament structure and they culminate in Jesus. And here's one of them. This, this is a huge one. Israel. Israel as a nation is called God's son. God calls his son out of Egypt. 
through baptismal waters, as, as it's called, right? Through the waters of the Red Sea, right? He brings them out for 40 years, tests them in the wilderness. They sin in every imaginable way. They fall in the wilderness and God delivers them into the promised land. How does Matthew structure his opening chapters of his gospel? He structures it as though Jesus is fulfilling Israel. Not just a prophecy here or there, like the actual role of the nation of Israel, the offspring of Abraham. How, how does... How does how does Matthew structure his gospel? Jesus goes through the waters, just like Israel goes through the Red Sea. Jesus is baptized, Matthew 3, 16, right? What happens right after that? Jesus goes into the wilderness for 40 days of testing, like 40 years in the wilderness. The three ways in which Jesus is tested about food, worshiping false gods, putting the Lord to the test, does that sound familiar? Those are the three ways Israel was tested in the wilderness. In fact, every time Jesus is tempted, he responds to Satan quoting not a random verse. He quotes only Deuteronomy, and he quotes Deuteronomy chapter 6 and 8 every time because that is a description of Israel's wilderness wandering. And Jesus is saying, I'm the true son of God, the true Israel, and during my 40 testing in the wilderness, not years but days, during my 40, I'm going to pass everywhere Israel failed. I'm the true son of God. I'm the true Israel. Now, if with that in mind, go back to what I thought Matthew was doing was misusing Hosea. Blasphemous thought, right? Let's go back and see what Matthew's doing with Hosea. And you could come up with dozens of these examples. We'll go through more in the future. But this is amazing to me. Hosea is talking about the history of Israel in Hosea 11. And Matthew sees a typology, a foreshadowing, a theme running towards Jesus, the true Israel. And what does he see? Just as God called his son Israel out of Egypt... He calls his true son, his true Israel, Jesus, out of Egypt during the Bethlehem slaughter of the children. And so Matthew is not misusing Hosea, taking it out of context and obviously misusing it because he doesn't really know how to handle the Bible. He's just forcing it to fit with Jesus. No, Matthew is actually a genius inspired by the Holy Spirit. This was the moment where I was just reeling in college. I can still, it's early January. I couldn't stop reading this. Over, RT, I was going to call R.T. France like, hey, you don't know who I am, but thank you for writing that. Uh, that was incredible. He, he says, Jesus doesn't just fulfill a few prophecies. He fulfills, I love this phrase, the whole warp and woof of the Old Testament. The whole structuring of the Old Testament, all of it, it's pointing to Jesus. It's preceding and culminating in Jesus. And so Matthew wasn't misusing the Bible. He was actually seeing it more clearly than I was, way more clearly than I was. And under inspiration, God showed him that Jesus is the true Israel. And therefore, that's typology. Now, do you see why that's amazing? That means that Jesus is fulfilling all these different things, which means you can actually see how these Old Testament things still matter to us today and why they ultimately help us worship Jesus more, because it shows us more of who Jesus is. And when you realize that there's several dozen of these major themes mm -hmm. running through the Old Testament, and then Don Carson said there's, there's scores of secondary level themes. That, so we're talking about over a hundred different things that run yeah. through the Old Testament into Jesus, and they all find their terminus in Christ. Well, now you see that the Old Testament is all about Jesus. It's all pointing to Jesus. And as Christians in the New Covenant era, we should love our Old Testaments because guess what they do? They enhance our view of Jesus. They make three-dimensional and high definition who Jesus is and what Jesus has come to do. And that's why books like Hebrews and, and books like that are showing how these are all ultimately about Christ. And if we miss that, we're going to ultimately miss the whole point of, of everything. Yeah, well, man, that's well said. I think that's why... Uh, Paul says in 2 Timothy 3.15, we know 3.16, 3.15, he's talking to Timothy, how from childhood you've been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to what? Make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. He's mm -hmm. talking about the Old Testament first. And so typology and everything Mark just said, like that's why Paul can say that. That's why he can then say in 3.16, all scriptures, you know, breathed out by God, it's profitable. Old Testament is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for instruction, or, or for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. He, he's talking first about the Old Testament. I mean, yeah, we think, oh, I want to live the Christian life. I want to go to Paul. Paul said, go to the Old Testament. It'll teach you how to live the Christian life. I mean, that's amazing. But you can only do that like with like what you're saying, typology, which helps us understand how all of that is pointing to Jesus. And once we get that, then we see all the riches that there is for us in it. Yes. So just to, can I give you a sense of where we're going in the next few weeks of this series? The series, we don't know how long it will be, but it will, it'll take a while. I don't know how long. But uh, th this right here will tell you kind of where we're going in the next weeks. Uh, we're going to walk through uh, the, what we're going to argue for six major covenants in the Bible. Uh, the first one is the most controversial, which is the one with Adam or the creation covenant, and then Noah, Abraham, Moses, David, and then Jesus with the new covenant. And we're going to walk through these one by one. Uh, I won't even make a promise about how, how but maybe a week each. We'll see how <laughs> it goes. Well, maybe a week each. But, but our goal is this. We, we want to balance two different things. Number one, we want to be able to explain the technical sort of context. What is this about? 
what does this mean side, but we also don't want to leave out the practical side. And so when we talk about Adam, our goal is to walk through some of the basic parts of Genesis 1 through 3 and draw basic application about temptation and about Adam's role and about what the fall meant and what happened as a result and be very practical, but also then go back up to the airplane view and see how Adam is called in Genesis, uh, no, no, Romans 5, Adam calls, no, Paul. Wow. Yeah. Paul, thank you. <laughs> Paul calls Adam a tupos in Greek, not the rapper, okay? The tupos in Greek, the, a type. Adam is called a type. Josh Cross, you didn't see that coming, did you? <laughs> you didn't see that coming. I didn't either. Uh, he call, calls him a type of the one to come. So Jesus is explicitly, uh, Adam is explicitly called a type of Christ. And um, you, you're going to see how the, like Romans 5 is going to flesh out Adam and his role in the fall and what that means for Christ and Noah and what the creation, what, what the covenant with uh, not flooding the earth again and, and all those things mean. So they're going to build off each other. They're going to bring more clarity as we go, hopefully. And then ultimately it culminates in the, in the new covenant. Yeah. Um, yeah, man, we, we, we have more we could say. Um, well, let's see here. Um, goodness. How about we just, we got, we're almost out of time. Can we just give the list of some of the things that we'll get to another let's, list here? Yeah, let's, let's just do that. That'll work. So Greg, Greg wrote these down. I think this is a good kind of just a sense of some of the things we'll, we'll try to get to as we go. Again, we've talked about Israel and the church. How about the land, uh, the, the promised land? What, how are we supposed to think about that today in the new covenant era? Where does that fit in? The temple? Will there be a third temple built in Israel? Is that part of biblical prophecy? Is that something we should be looking forward to? Does that happen during the millennium? Or is that a, is that a different way? We're, we're going to argue in the negative on that, but we're going we're to get to why. Uh, king and kingdom, identity of God's people, identity of the church, the mission, purpose, success of the church. How we're supposed to understand the Sabbath law today is part of this discussion. Do we, are we supposed to be Christian Sabbatarians today? Has the Sabbath moved from Saturday to the Lord's Day Sunday? And are we under Sabbatarian law today? Um, I preached on that before, you know, maybe three or four years ago, but we're going to go back and talk about that. Uh, covenant of grace versus eternal covenant of redemption. Uh, th those are some of the things that we'll try to get to. Concluding comments, Greg? Um, I just, I'm looking forward to this. I, I think this is going to be, like, I think it's going to be good for us to go through this. Um, uh, but also, like, I'm, I'm just excited as a church we get to think about this together. Um, because any, anything that, that pushes us to understand God's Word, not just particular individual facts, but how it all fits together, like that's only going to serve us better. That's going to enhance our ability to share the gospel because we can make better sense of the gospel. Right. Um, it's going to enhance our ability to just talk with with one another about Scripture um, because we're gonna we're gonna understand it better. And you'll you, you know hopefully there'll be some categories in place and some things you know become rooted in us as a result of this. That when we're having conversation, it's going to elevate that conversation in ways that it wouldn't have been otherwise. Um, and, I, and I mean, our prayer life, we understand the big picture of what God's doing. You know, how are we going to pray for ourselves, for our family, for our, 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 um, our neighbors, our coworkers, our community? Like all of this feeds into that. You know, what, what do we expect, you know, pray for the, for the success of the gospel in the world? Like how, how we understand, you know, the success of the gospel in the world affects how we pray for salvation, how we pray for revival, how we pray for missions and evangelism. Um, and all of that. So, man, I'm, I'm just excited to see practically how this is going to affect us as a church. And, man, I'm praying the Lord's going to, you know, just, just so root us in His Word in a new way that we're, we're going to see some great things happen. Can you pray for us? Yeah, absolutely. Father, we thank You. Uh, we thank You so much for Your Word, Lord. Uh, what a treasure, what a gift. And, Lord, we thank You that uh, we can understand it with Your help by the Holy Spirit and through using the faculties that You've given us uh, just to be able to read. Um, and so, Lord, we pray as we, we think about uh, this story of the Bible and the unity of the Bible, how it fits together. Um, God, I pray that, that each one of us would, would grow uh, in, in some amazing ways in our walk with you and our understanding of you and our, our appreciation of Christ and what he's done for us um, in the glorious gospel that uh, has saved us. Um, and, Lord, I just pray we as a church we'd be more uh, rooted and grounded uh, in the truth, better able to discuss it, better able to talk about it, better equipped to pray, and, and so many other things, Lord. So just be with us in the coming weeks uh, in a very special way in this, Lord, even as we pray that for uh, the Esther study as well. Uh, Lord, help us know you better and know Christ better. Uh, and we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.